Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Liberty Me U tonight. Uh, we're here tonight with Jason Brennan. He's an assistant professor of strategy, economics, ethics, and public policy at Georgetown University. We're going to be talking about his new book, Why Not Capitalism? Uh, he's the author of several other books, including Compulsory Voting for and Against, uh, Libertarianism, What Everyone Needs to Know, and The Ethics of Voting, as well as others. And he is uh, working on two new books, uh, Markets Without Limits, and against politics. But uh, I, I think this is going to be very interesting. I've heard even from people who don't like uh, Jason Brennan in some other contexts that this is actually a good book anyway. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to read it. I put it on my reading list and I hope you will too. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jason. All right. Hi, everybody. So what I wanted to talk to you today about is capitalism versus socialism and where the debate is and how the book that I wrote responds to that. So I guess you could kind of see the debate that we've had in the past 150 years or so about socialism versus capitalism as really capitalism has kind of won in the dirt uh, in the sense that most people, including most left wing people now, will agree that in the real world with realistic people, people who have the kinds of motives that humans have, with the flaws that humans have, capitalism is going to be a better system. So, cap so most socialists actually will now even agree that, you know, given that people are kind of selfish, capitalism will work better. They realize that every time we've tried to have a, a socialist system, it hasn't worked out very well. But where they've retreated to is, in a sense, the moral high ground. There's still this kind of idea that most people have, and I think, in fact, a lot of libertarians have, that... Uh, if only we were good, if only we were moral, if only we were the way that we teach our children to be and we wish that people were, we would dispense with private property and we would dispense with markets and would be socialist instead. Uh, and I think that that idea is shared even by many of the most prominent defenders of capitalism. Uh, you can even see traces of that idea in people like David Hume and Adam Smith and a lot of early classical liberals. And I think that that idea is mistaken. So what I want to do is defend capitalism not on economic terms, but on moral terms. And what I want to try to do is show that capitalism retains the moral high ground. All right, so that's like the setup for this. So what do I, first I want to just define my terms. Like what do I mean by capitalism and socialism? I think we have to define these, uh, the difference between capitalism and socialism is essentially about control rights. Who has ownership rights over stuff? In socialism, private property and the means of production is forbidden. And in capitalism, people are allowed to have private property as a means of production. In socialism, the sphere of economic liberty, at least in the way that libertarians understand the term economic liberty, is very constrained. And in capitalism, the sphere of economic liberty, in the way that libertarians understand that term, is not very constrained. Uh, so people, people look at the 20th century and they say socialism was a disaster. Uh, we had mass murder. We had mass starvation. We had – it was just you know dictatorships and so on. But they think, look at this and go, the problem was with the people, not with the system. I mean, you have some people even saying things like socialism is a good theory, but not for this species. The problem is that socialism asks us to be kind to one another and loving towards one another. But the best that we can come up with in a socialist system is a Pol Pot or Pol Pot or Stalin. But the problem seems to be with us, not with socialism. And many people on the left will admit that capitalism has done pretty well, poverty has been going down, more people have more than they used to, but they have this kind of worry that capitalism is really just bribing people and relying upon their self-interest in a kind of morally problematic way. So the immediate motive to serving others in capitalism, according to someone like uh, the philosopher Jerry Cohen, is not that I care about other human beings, but I just want to serve my own interests. Um, and so I kind of see everyone else as instrumental to serving myself, and it seems to be repugnantly selfish. So many people have that idea, and they end up having the idea that if only we were good, we would be socialist. Now, the most prominent uh, defender of this view, I think the person who's like the best exponent of this idea, an idea that almost everyone has, was the Marxist philosopher Jerry Cohen, um, who died back in 2009. And Jerry Cohen wrote a book called Why Not Socialism that was, uh, it was originally published as an article in a book and then later republished as a small pamphlet uh, right before his death. And in the book Why Not uh, Socialism, Jerry Cohen um, – has a number of basic claims, some empirical claims and some moral claims. The empirical claim is that some reasonably adequate form of socialism is feasible in the real world. And that's not really what interests me. What interests me are the moral claims. His moral claim is that a market-based society and a capitalist society is intrinsically repugnant and that socialism is intrinsically desirable. 
So to try to show that, and he thinks that you think that too. And the way he tries to illustrate this is with a thought experiment. He says, imagine that you and some friends go on a camping trip. Now, when you come to the camping trip, you have your own stuff already. You have private goods that you bring with you. But when you show up, because it's your friends and you care and love about each other and love one another, you take all of your goods and share them freely and equally. Everyone can kind of partake of everything. But because you care and love about one another, no one kind of grabs extra stuff. No one tries to free ride off of others or exploit them. You kind of share things in a way that shows a concern that everyone has a good time and everyone has an equally good time. And, you know, you divide up the tasks of camping in an equitable way so that no one, no one has to get stuck doing all the lousy jobs while someone has a better job. So basically, if you really loved and cared about one another, you'd kind of live a sort of socialist lifestyle, at least in the context of the camping trip. And he says, now imagine if instead of having sort of a socialist camping trip, you behave the way that capitalists behave. You made it a capitalist camping trip. So he says, suppose your friend Harry uh, demands extra food because he's especially good at fishing. He says, you know what, guys, I'll, I'll do more fishing so we can all eat more fish, but only if I get to have extra food. And suppose Sylvia finds a really good fishing spot and she's willing to tell the rest of you where it is, but only if you give her some sort of payment. Or suppose that Leslie has really good knowledge about how to crack nuts and she's willing to like share her knowledge and crack more nuts for everybody, but only if she gets out of uh, digging the latrine. Or suppose that there's another character, another friend of yours, Morgan, whose father left him a well-stocked fishing pond 30 years ago. And when you guys go camping, he goes and finds the food and uh, gloats at dinner about how he has more food than everybody else. Cohen says that would be a really repugnant and awful camping trip, and you wouldn't want to go on a trip like that. But nevertheless, it's exactly the kind of behavior that you see in real-life capitalism. So he says, given that you liked the socialist version of the camping trip and you hated the capitalist version of, this, of the camping trip, we have to ask the question, is there some reason why it would not be intrinsically desirable to run large-scale societies that way? Wouldn't it just obviously be better if the whole world were like that socialist camping trip? And he thinks almost everyone's going to say, yeah, it would be kind of better if the world were like the socialist camping trip rather than the way the world is. So he thinks that once you've agreed to that, that you're going to agree to the following. We tolerate capitalism only because we think we have to. And if you look at a lot of economic arguments and the kinds of arguments that libertarians are inclined to make, it seems like that's what they're saying. It's like we live under a capitalist system and should live under a capitalist system because of the way people are. People are fearful. They're greedy. They have limits to their knowledge and limits to the degree to which they care about one another and are willing to help one another. They're not all that generous. And if you try to instantiate socialist institutions, they use that as an opportunity to prey upon one another. So maybe we should be capitalists, but we are capitalists because people are flawed. So Cohen says, if we were good, wouldn't we be socialist? And if you agree to that, if you say, yeah, if people were good, if people were angels, they'd be socialist, then Cohen thinks you've basically conceded his point, which is that socialism has the moral high ground. The problem is that we human beings aren't good enough for it. Okay. Now you might say, well, if it's not feasible to be socialist, why would it be desirable? And I think that that's, a, and Cohen says that's a mistaken inference to, to deny that something, to say that because something's not feasible, it's not desirable. And I think he's right about that. A really easy good way to illustrate that is this. Suppose I could cure AIDS by, you know, snapping my fingers. Obviously I can't do that, but it would be desirable if I could. Or if you've watched Star Wars, like, wouldn't it be great to have the force? Right? It's not possible to have the force. It's not feasible to have the force, but it would be desirable to do so. Or it might not be feasible to, for us to get to a, a world where no one makes war upon one another, but obviously it's desirable. So Cohen says, look, it, whether or not something is desirable has nothing to do with whether it's feasible. Um, but when we're talking about why capitalism or why Cohen's form of socialism isn't feasible, he says the real problem with it is just that people aren't very nice. They could be nice. They're just not. There's nothing inherent in human nature. Everyone could choose to do the right thing. They just happen not to do so. For what it's worth, uh, Cohen does actually concede um, that the calculation problem with socialism. He concedes there's no way to have cooperation on the scale of billions without some sort of form of market prices. So he has an extended part of his book where he says maybe some form of market socialism would be possible. We don't really know that, but I'm not going to really dwell on that. So that's kind of where it stands. Cohen, I think, has explained the intuitions that most people have, that capitalism is sort of intrinsically bad, and if we only we were good, we'd be socialists. Um, but I think his argument fails, and I think we have to take his argument on head on. And what I would try to do in my book, Why Not Capitalism, is grant him basically all of his assumptions about what morality requires, grant him all his assumptions about how to do political philosophy, and then show even if we grant him all those assumptions, his argument doesn't work, and what emerges is an argument for capitalism. So in one part of the book, what I do is parallel or parody uh, Cohen's argument. 
So Cohen tells a story of a camping trip and then imagines it going a socialist camping trip and then imagines it going capitalist and it gets worse. I do the same kind of thing because I want to show what's sort of wrong with Cohen's argument. So to illustrate this, what how, like to argue that capitalism would actually be a your utopian society, a perfectly good society would be capitalist. I draw upon uh, the te television show, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, uh, which is on Disney Junior right now. So everything I'm about to say is an accurate description of the, of the TV show. Uh, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, presents a village. It's a village in which the characters Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Professor Von Drake, Willie the Giant, Clarabelle Cow, and so on live together. Um, and they have both communal and private property. They have some communal property like uh, communal amphitheaters and some communal parks, but they also have private property. They own their own houses and they have their own toys and things like that. But not only do they have private property and personal items like toothbrushes, but they actually are capitalists. So Clarabelle Cow owns a Moo Muffin factory and a Moo Mart sundry store. Uh, Minnie Mouse has a boutique, which is a bow making factory and bow store. Professor Von Drake has nanotech machinery that can manufacture various items sort of on demand. Willie the Giant and Donald Duck both own farms. And the characters own this stuff and trade with one another as capitalists, providing value for value. Now, when you look at the, the way that the show is presented, there's nothing in it that a socialist could mount a principled objection to. The characters um, are always willing to share. They're always willing to help one another when someone's on need. They never free ride upon one another. They never exploit one another. They do have some inequalities in their possession of wealth, but this doesn't interfere with their community in any way. For them, a difference in wealth is no, is no more than having different skin color. It just doesn't interfere with their ability to empathize with one another or to form communities. Um, if there's some sort of problem, they'll always come together to uh, solve the problem, making use of their different talents. And moreover, they're happy to make trades with one another. Like they trade with one another, not because they're deplorably selfish, but because you know they care about each other and they also care about um, uh, they care about sort of maximizing the value that's produced in their society. And moreover, one thing about this is that Minnie Mouse say like, why does Minnie Mouse want people to buy bows? Uh, she doesn't want people to buy bows as a favor to her. Right? She, for her, making bows is kind of an art, and she wants people to want her bows for their own sake. She'd be disappointed if she learned that the only reason that, say, one of the movie stars in uh, the care in the show buys bows from her is because it's a favor to Minnie Mouse. Instead, she wants them to buy it because they think this is a good bow, and I'm willing to buy it because I want it. Like that, that means something to her. So it's a capitalist society, but there's nothing wrong with it. I think you'd have to basically have a socialism fetish to uh, to have a problem with this uh, society. Now I say, what if the socialist, what if the village became like socialism? So I, I describe in, in the book uh, Donald Duck starting like a five-year plan and that causing mass starvation and Mickey Mouse imposing himself as dictator and murdering uh, all the people that uh, get in his way. And there's massive famine and massive amounts of death and hundreds of millions of people die, just like in real life socialism. Uh, and it's obviously much worse. So it kind of ends up being an extended parody where I take everything that Cohen does and turn it around, and I actually literally will take paragraphs of his out of his book and just re switch around the words capitalism and socialism, and all his complaints about capitalism seem to be equally good complaints about actual real-life socialism. So uh, the, the characters in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse world um, live on what I think are five basic moral principles. One is a principle of voluntary community. The idea here is that people will interact with one another and live together in peace and harmony without recourse to violence or threats of violence. They don't have any need for uh, violent enforcement of their rights because they're just too good to have that. They live together in a principle of mutual respect. They care. They, they think that everyone else is an end in himself. They never take advantage of that person. Um, they tolerate differences. And not only do they tolerate differences, they actually celebrate differences. They act on a principle of reciprocity, which is what community is really about. For Cohen, and Cohen agrees to this, by the way, community is not about I just sacrifice myself for everybody else, but rather community is about reciprocity. I serve you because I care about you, but also because I expect that you will in turn treat me the same way. And they act upon that kind of uh, norm. They have a principle of social justice as well. They make sure that the institutions of their society are set up to kind of ensure that everyone does well and no one falls through the cracks through no fault of their own, but they do so without using the kind of sort of violent methods of social justice that we see in the real world. They don't need to use taxation and redistribution. Rather, um, they can just voluntarily give to those in need. And finally, they act on the principle of beneficence, um, where they just always act to, be, to benefit others. So that ends, up being the, that ends up being the parody. And what I end up saying to socialist readers is, 
you probably suspect that there's something kind of bogus about the argument that I've been making so far. And you're right. But the thing is, I've purposefully taken the argument and structured it exactly the same as Cohen's. I've used the same language, the same sorts of moves. So if my argument for capitalism against socialism is so far bogus, it's because Cohen's argument for socialism against capitalism is similarly bogus. However, something magical is going to happen. When you take Cohen's bogus argument for socialism and my identical bogus argument for capitalism and then reflect upon just what went wrong, what will emerge is a genuine argument for capitalism and a genuine argument that the moral high ground is the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse version of capitalism. So uh, what I'm going to do now then is explain just what's wrong with Cohen's argument and what's wrong with the basic kind of argument for socialism that most people will make. Cohen, remember, is just, he's just stating something that most people think. So Cohen has two basic fallacies uh, in his book, in his kind of argument for socialism. One is that when he complains about capitalism, he's complaining about what capitalism is like in the real world. And not all of his complaints are accurate, but a lot of them are. There is a lot of really nasty stuff in real life capitalism. People really do take advantage of one another. They do exploit each other. They do treat each other badly. They are too selfish in kind of a negative, not in the Ayn Randian sense of selfish, but in the kind of common sense negative version of selfish. Uh, they, they're callous. They're not caring. They're, they're too concerned with trinkets and baubles, and they're too concerned with status seeking, and they are too fe fearful and greedy. I think Cohen's right about that. But then he's basically saying, look at real life capitalism and now compare that to a, a fictional stipulated version of, of a, a fictional version of socialism in which I stipulate that everyone is morally perfect. Wouldn't that be better? And he, he might be right. Maybe this kind of fictional version of socialism is better than real life capitalism, but that doesn't tell us very much about whether socialism is better than capitalism. If I say socialism with perfect people is better than capitalism with real people, therefore socialism is just better than capitalism, you think, well, hold on, you're manipulating kind of two variables at once here. One is the type of social system and the other is the way that the people are. So sure, ideal socialism is better than real life capitalism, but that leaves open the question of whether ideal socialism is better than ideal capitalism and whether realistic socialism is better than realistic capitalism. Uh, it's bogus in the same way that, imagine if I said, uh, I don't like democracy. What would be really much better is um, a form of monarchy in which the king was omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. So I can imagine a form of, of monarchy with an omnibenevolent, omniscient king. That's better than real-life democracy. Therefore, monarchy is just clearly better than democracy. You'd say, yeah, that's kind of bogus. Uh, obviously, uh, a monarchy ruled by a perfect king is better than what we have in the real world with real-life democracy. But what about democracy with the perfect people? Would that be better or worse? Uh, so what Cohen didn't do, what he needed to do was compare his ideal of socialism to a capitalist ideal. And he didn't, it didn't occur to him to do that. Maybe he didn't think that there could be such a capitalist ideal. So that's part of what I want to do is to show him what the capitalist ideal would actually look like. The other big mistake that Cohen makes is to identify socialism with an ethos. So he often conflates socialism, which is just a way of distributing control rights over the means of production, with nice motives. You know, he often talks as if socialism is just by definition kindness and love and fellow feeling and community. And he talks as if capitalism is sort of by definition fear, fear and greed and selfishness and callousness. So that I've even had, like when presenting this work to others, like among other philosophers, I've heard them say, well, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse has sort of a capitalist economic system with a socialist ethos. And I'm like, no, I don't want to even accept that point. Uh, you shouldn't call niceness and kindness a socialist ethos. That's that's. There's no reason to think that's particularly socialist. Socialism is just about who owns what. Capitalism is about who owns what. And the moral norms here aren't particular to either one of them. So despite all his com worries about com uh, community and things like that, Cohen never actually asks the question, well, does capitalism make people more selfish, make them more greedy, make them more fearful? Uh, he just sort of assumes that it does because it's built into the logic of the system. Turns out he's completely wrong about that. Uh, there are a number of social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, moral psychologists, and others who study the question of what does capitalism do to us and what does socialism do to us. Some of these people are people like Herbert Gintis and Joseph Henrik and Paul Zak. Um, and it turns out that, as a matter of fact, the biggest cultural predictor that you will be trustworthy, fair, cooperative, trusting of others, and generous is the extent to which your society that you come from is market-oriented. 
So one way that uh, there's this guy named Herbert Gintis that tested this. He he was a Marxist and he wanted to prove that capitalism corrupted people. So what he would do is go around and find people uh, from various kinds of societies and have them play these games that people commonly play in economics. Things like the dictator game, which tests to see whether you will be unconditionally generous or uh, the um, ultimatum game, which gives you an opportunity to um, punish somebody for being unfair to you at your own expense and so on. And there are other kinds of games that economists play where you have the opportunity to be trustworthy and trusting and so on. And to Gintis's surprise, what he found was that people from market-oriented societies were much nicer than people from socialist societies or people from traditional societies. And other people like Joseph Henrik have found the same kind of thing. So it just turns out empirically that uh, people from capitalist societies are nicer than people from non-capitalist societies. So Cohen's just wrong about that. Um, and I give in the book, I go through a number of examples and some of the empirical evidence here. So, so far, all I've really argued is that Cohen's argument for socialism has failed. Uh, he thinks he's proven to us that socialism is better than capitalism, but at most, all he's proven is that a utopian form of socialism is better than real life capitalism, but it leaves open the question of whether a utopian form of capitalism is even better than utopian socialism. And he hasn't shown us that capitalism has any corrupting effects on our character. He's sort of assumed that, but it turns out he's mistaken about that. So the final bit that I have to do in this book is to try to explain to him why utopian capitalism is even better than utopian socialism. And if I do that, if I succeed in doing that, then basically I've captured the moral high ground for capitalism. Because remember, the debate so far is capitalism works better in terms of economics, socialism works better in terms of morality. I want to take away that from the socialists and say capitalism is better economics and it's better from a moral point of view. So let's get to the utopian part. Uh, what do I mean by utopia? What I mean by utopia is this, and I'm following Cohen here. Imagine a world that's exactly like ours, where human beings have the same abilities, the same cognitive abilities. They're not any smarter than we are. They don't have any kind of omniscience or anything like that. But just suppose everyone's morally perfect. We just ramp up their morality. We turn the moral meter all the way up to 10. No one ever does the wrong thing. Everyone always chooses to do the right thing. And people have whatever motives they should have according to morality. Uh, so the question here is, would that utopia be capitalist? Would it be socialist? Or would it be something else altogether? What kinds of economic institutions would utopia have, if any? Cohen just kind of assumes without much argument that it would be utopia, that it would be socialist. But I want to show is that it would actually look quite a bit like the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. That's that's what utopia is. So what does it take to prove that utopia would be capitalist? It really takes two things. One is I have to explain why there would be private property in utopia, why it would make utopia better to have private property than to do without it, in particular private property in the means of production. And two, why they would make use of markets and have extensive libertarian economic liberty and why that would make utopia look better. Okay, so let's start by defining uh, property rights. Like what do we mean when we say that somebody has a property right in something such as this uh, Anna um, figurine that my son Keaton owns? What do we mean when you say Keaton owns this? We say that things like this, Keaton can destroy, use this, or sorry, he can use this object at will. He can play with it whenever he wants. Um, he doesn't have to ask permission to use it, provided he sort of respects other people's rights. Um, he can alter it. He could color on it. He could break it in half so he could destroy it if he wanted to. Um, he could sell it or give it away or transfer it to someone else or even rent it. Um, he he could use it to earn income, I suppose. Uh, he And if, if someone else damages this thing that belongs to my son Keaton, they would kind of owe him compensation. They can't destroy it or use it without his permission. And finally, everyone has this sort of a moral obligation to respect all of these rights. So that's what a property right is. It's a bundle of rights over things. Now, when economists are asked to defend private property, the kinds of arguments they give rely usually rely upon flaws in human nature. So economists will say things like, if we don't privatize items, if we leave them in the commons, this will lead to something called the tragedy of the commons in which everyone will use the resource too quickly and overuse it because they have no incentive to keep it around. They worry that other people will use it first and that it won't be preserved. But that kind of argument we can't use right now because we're supposing for the sake of argument that everyone is morally perfect. We're imagining a world in which people have no moral flaws. So in a world without flaws, people don't lead to, they don't have tragic commons. So most of the kinds of arguments for private property that you get in basic econ don't work here. Um, and that's what Cohen is, is relying upon to get you to an argument for socialism. However, what I want to show you is that even if people were morally perfect, even if they were so good that they could make socialism work, they'd still have reasons to have capitalism. 
Now, since we're not relying upon these economic arguments, we're going to be looking to more kind of aesthetic type arguments or arguments that have to do with like the meaning we get out of life. So let's think about a few reasons to have uh, capitalism or have private property. One is that human beings are project pursuers. Um, we have ideas that we want to implement in the world. Uh, we have things that we want to do, projects we want to work on over a sustained period. And to pursue these kinds of projects requires a sustained at will access to goods. So you can't see it, but like right over there are all my guitars and my amplifiers and stuff like that. And one of my projects is to, you know, play certain kinds of music. And in order for me to be able to do that the way that I want, I need that stuff over there to kind of, I need to count on that stuff being there tomorrow. I need to count on people leaving that for me to use and not just taking it willy nilly. Uh, if it were open for everyone to use, even if there were lots of different kinds of instruments and we had like a, an abundance of them, it would be hard for me to kind of implement my goals. And that's just for something as simple as a hobby. Now think about like writing a book or, or working on a farm or so on. Um, people, now, and a lot of socialists would agree to this point. They'll say, yeah, we agree to that. We think that there should be private property and personal goods such as Anna figurines or guitars, but there shouldn't be private property in the means of production because why would you need that? Why would you want sustained exclusive access to say a farm? When this is what I say to them, I think, I think they're lacking empathy with capitalists basically. Uh, so I would say to a socialist, like, look, you as socialist intellectual, like, look, you can understand why you'd want to write a paper by yourself rather than writing a paper collectively or having it be done by committee. Right. You can understand why an artist would want to paint a painting by himself rather than having the painting done collectively or by committee or by group deliberation. If you can understand that, then maybe you can understand why for Willie the Giant, he needs to have his own farm. It's not really good enough that it be kind of, that he gets access to the collective farm, but rather he has a particular vision for how he would like to implement farming. And in order to realize that vision, he uh, he needs his own farm. Now, if there were some cost to other people for having that farm, that would be one thing. But if in, you know, in a kind of utopian capitalism, there really isn't. So this kind of leads into the second point, which is that we have a desire to be at home in the world, uh, to realize our kind of vision. And in order to do that, we need to have our kind of own niches where we have control over some things. You know, I think socialists in, in Cohen and others often forget that we're not the Borg. Like we are, there's a pluralism in ideas of like what the good life is like and what. Um, how we'd like to run things. And so rather than having it be everything is collectively owned and we all kind of deliberate and try to reach a consensus on how to do things, a different way to deal with that is split stuff up and let everyone kind of do it their own way. Uh, beyond that, even in a world in which everyone cares about each other, constantly having to ask permission to see whether you can use things or having to abide by a schedule can be kind of oppressive, right? Uh, I'm here in my house. This is my family room behind me. And, uh, you know, if I had to constantly ask for permission to even hear, like, like, what am I going to do right now? I had to ask permission for things. I can kind of get in the way with leading a decent life sometimes. So we want to minimize that and give people a space of freedom. Um, and there's a number of other kinds of arguments like this, which give reasons to, like I go over in the book, that gives us reasons to think that private property could make utopia better, even though, uh, by hypothesis, people are good enough in utopia to make socialism work. So with that, I want to move on to some of the arguments for why they have markets. So, so far, I've kind of given a few justifications for having private property and the means of production in utopia. But now let's think about the reasons for markets. Uh, there's two basic reasons. One is that people in a utopian system want to be self-authors, uh, or at least we want to let them be authors of their own lives. Uh, the decisions that we make with regard to how we consume, how we purchase, how we choose, what we what trade-offs we make between one kind of good and another shape who we are, not only express who we are, but shape who we are. So when you allow people to make those decisions for themselves, they in some sense become the authors of their own lives. When those decisions are made collectively for them, then they're not really authors of their own lives. So for that reason, we have at least some prima facie reason to want people to have a large sphere of economic liberty and to be able to make the kinds of trade-offs and contracts and so on that people make in markets. But beyond that, there's actually a benevolence-based reason to uh, have a market. And this is something that Jerry Cohen, I think, has to agree to because, in his own words, he concedes that so-called bourgeois economics, by which he just means economics, uh, is basically sound. So remember, all the people in Utopia are hypothesized to be perfectly benevolent, as benevolent as anyone ought to be. So think of it this way. Imagine if I had this magic wand here. It's actually a, a hex bug um, container, but imagine it's a magic wand. Uh, and if I were to wave this magic wand, it would instantly make everyone in the world 30 times richer. Uh, 
would this serve the common good? I think you'd have to agree it would. And Jerry Cohen, my intellectual opponent here, would agree that it would. Now suppose I have a, a weaker version of the magic wand. I wave it and it makes everyone 30 times richer, but it takes, say, 150 years to do that. Jerry Cohen and most socialists would agree, yeah, that wand serves the common good. Now imagine instead of having um, a magic wand, I have a philosopher queen, it's now Anna again, and Anna, uh, the philosopher queen, comes up with a plan for how to run the economy. She gives everyone a task, like you can be either a doctor or a farmer. She gives you some options. You can be a doctor or you can be a farmer. Uh, you, some other person, can be a uh, um, you know, a veterinarian or an artist. You can be someone who uh, you know, works stocking shelves or something else. She comes up with a plan, and if we all abide by her plan, it turns out that we'll all get 30 times richer over a course of 150 years. Now, socialists are going to say that benevolent people who want to serve the common good will want to go along with the philosopher queen's plan. After all, going along with her plan is basically equivalent to waving the magic wand. Uh, and if people are perfectly benevolent, they're going to want to wave that wand. Unfortunately, it turns out that there's no such thing as a philosopher queen. No one can have that level of knowledge. That's what the calculation problem socialism shows. And Jerry Cohen agrees with that, and most socialists nowadays agree with that too. However, there is something that's kind of like waving the magic wand, and that's the market. What the market does, what market prices do, is coordinate people's activities in the way that the philosopher queen would want, which is equivalent, remember, to waving that magic wand. Now, that's true to some degree even in the real world in which there are market failures, in which people will take advantage of one another and hurt one another. It's even more true under utopian conditions in which people will never exploit one another, never take advantage of one another, and never do anything that socialists would think is morally wrong. So it looks like in utopian conditions we have reasons to have private property in the means of production and reasons to make use of markets, which means that even if we were good enough to be socialist, it would be even better to be capitalist. But there's one final argument which I think is kind of decisive here, which is just this. Which would you choose? If you had to choose between living in Cohen's utopian camping trip or in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse utopian capitalist village, uh, let's say with real people rather than anthropomorphic animals, which one would you like? Now, you're the people who are watching this right now, you're not a random group of people, but uh, I've asked that question in front of maybe 200 or so philosophers in the academy, uh, most of whom are quite left-wing, and even when I ask them that, the overwhelming majority of them say they'd rather live in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse village than in Cohen's camping trip. And the thing is, that seems to be evidence that the camping trip is better, but the funny thing about that, I'm sorry, that seems to be evidence that uh, um, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse world, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse capitalism is better than utopian socialism, but the funny thing is, it's actually a trick question, because the cool thing about utopian capitalism is that it doesn't make you choose, and that's a reason why it's better. Uh, people are different, right? Uh, and some people would like to live in a socialist kibbutz. And the thing about clubhouse capitalism is that it's totally fine with that. The Mickey Mouse Clubhouse has a capitalist superstructure, but if, say, um, libertarian kind of capitalist anarchist voluntary superstructure, but if the Smurfs were to come in and wanted to run a little Smurf commune in the middle of it, the other characters would be totally fine with that as long as the Smurfs were likewise tolerant of the capitalists. So What's kind of funny about this, I think, is that Jerry Cohen, my opponent, his first major book that really got out of people's attention was a critique of the libertarian philosopher Robert Nozick's Anarchy State Utopia. And in Anarchy State Utopia, Nozick says that utopia is not all one thing uh, you, because people are different. There's a plurality of different ways of living. There's not one society that's best for everybody uh, because we're so different from one another. So instead, what, you, what utopia would really be is a meta-utopia in which different kinds of society could flourish side by side, and people would be free to choose whichever society they want. They wouldn't be stuck in any one of them. And so you'd have a libertarian framework, though some people might choose to live kind of non-libertarian in non-libertarian societies within that framework. Uh, and so what I think ends up happening is if we follow Jerry Cohen's methodology the way he wants us to and do it um, – and do it consistently, unlike what Cohen does, he does it inconsistently, what you end up getting from Cohen is the vindication of Nozick's anarchy state utopia. I think Cohen's argument for socialism, properly understood, ends up becoming an argument that Robert Nozick was right all along about what utopia is like, and utopia would be a kind of libertarian framework. So the conclusion of all of this is, is well, here's what you get. Sure, Cohen's right that ideal socialism is better than real-life capitalism. However, Ideal capitalism is better than ideal socialism, 
and realistic capitalism is better than realistic socialism. So capitalism basically dominates over socialism from both a moral point of view and an economic point of view. In the real world with flawed people who are greedy and fearful and selfish and mean, you want to have capitalism instead of socialism. But if I could wave a magic wand and make everyone morally perfect, you still want to have capitalism rather than socialism. So no matter what, capitalism beats socialism. Uh, socialists are basically offering us an inferior product. Uh, in the real world, capitalism encourages entrepreneurs to give you things that you want at prices you can afford to pay. But in under ideal conditions, it does even better because it gives you an opportunity to live under your own personal utopia. Okay, so uh, with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in the questions tab to the right, or if you'd like to come on video and ask, you can ask uh, by clicking video chatting above the chat window and then clicking start your webcam, and I should be able to bring you on camera. Our first question is from Frank Markopoulos. He asks, what arguments can capitalists use to argue against leftists or leftist arguments for social justice? Yeah, I, I think you shouldn't argue against it. I think you should endorse it. Um, so here's so a lot of libertarians think that the word so, uh, social justice is just nonsensical. They might be right, but if it is a nonsensical term that's just used for rhetorical reasons, then you should just use it too in order to disarm them. Uh, you should say, I'm a capitalist because I endorse social justice and their heads will explode and they won't be able to make anything of it. But I think actually, at least among philosophers, uh, um, the word social justice does have a meaning. Uh, and the meaning is something like this. When you're trying to talk about what legitimates institutions, any kind of course of institution, including property institutions, uh, one of the tests of the legitimacy of that institution is supposed to be, how does it fare? What kinds of consequences will it produce? In particular, will it produce consequences that will tend to be good for everybody? And even someone like John Locke, when he's trying to justify private property, makes use of a social justice type concern. He says, in order for you to have an exclusive right to some part of the world that at one point wasn't owned and everyone had access to and could use, uh, you have to think about the consequences it has on everybody else, and you should make sure that it leaves enough and is good for others and tends to make their lives actually better. And if you look at the second treaty, yeah, that's what he says. Um, I think that capitalists can say social, social justice is realized in capitalism. In fact, it's realized better in, in, in the real world. It's better realized in capitalism than it is in socialism. Uh, you can just look at like how well people do. Uh, the poor in a capitalist society are richer than the poor in a socialist society. Uh, even in the United States, uh, we consider a, um, a purchasing price parity adjusted uh, poverty rate uh, to be $11,500 for a, a one adult male living by himself. That's over the median income in the world. It's over the uh, mean income in the world too. That's richer than most, that's about four times richer than the typical person alive right now. Uh, you know, people, countries that are highly capitalist, what they consider their poverty rate is richer than what's the median level of income in non-capitalist societies. So, and that's even before you take into account any welfare benefits, any transfers or anything like that. Now, uh, in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse world, they realize social justice. They realize like socialist versions of social justice. They just do it without socialism. They do it because the capitalist uh, economic system makes it so people don't need handouts in the first place. It makes them rich. It kind of it, it doesn't, uh, it, it makes them rich by its normal operation. Um, and then if some people fall through the cracks through no fault of their own, people will just give charitably. I think, I think what a lot of leftists do is they uh, confuse the question of social justice with guarantees. They'll say things like, we want to guarantee that people get certain outcomes. And I say to them, it's an empirical question whether any particular economic system produces results. Uh, you can't treat a law as a real guarantee. There's a difference between guaranteeing as when an economist says that um, quadrupling the minimum wage would, lead, it would guarantee unemployment versus guaranteeing as expressing a firm intent as when uh, George Bush guarantees that no child will be left behind. So just use the, use the language of social justice and argue for capitalism on that basis. That's my, that's my final view. Do you think that uh, libertarians and others for that matter get a little bit too attached to particular words instead of uh, trying to use words the best they can to convey particular meanings? Uh, yeah, I do think that's true. I think, like take the, the issue with social justice, uh, you know, Hayek wrote that claim that social justice is mirage and it's a nonsensical term. And he's probably accurately describing how most people at the time he was writing were using that. 
But then Hayek at the same time read Rawls' theory of justice and said, yeah, I basically agree with Rawls. Uh, he and I disagree on just like some terminology. Uh, Hayek says, I think that there is a question of a question of justice in the design of institutions, and I basically accept Rawls' view of, uh, of what the principles of justice are. I just disagree with him about the economic things that realize those institutions, or like what, what institutions would be justified, but I accept Rawls' view of uh, what, what accounts as a justification. Uh, so that's the way of putting that. Is he basically says, I, I accept Rawls' test of good institutions, but I disagree with him about what institutions pass that test. So I think libertarians have kind of decided we're going to use the word social justice. Social justice is a, a flag that the left waves, and to be libertarian and show that you're on the libertarian team is we're going to refuse to use that word that shows fidelity to our side. I don't see any point in doing that. Uh, it disarms your opponents if you use their language. And if you want to convince people, you have to talk in terms that they understand and their premises. Uh, you know, it's one thing if you say Ayn Rand is right about morality and that therefore capitalism, but most people on the left are going to go, Ayn Rand is crazy about morality and I'm never going to be convinced of that. So I'm not, if, if that's what it takes to justify capitalism, no thank you. So if you say, you guys, you leftists are correct about morality and you know what's justified on that basis? Capitalism. Then they go, wow, I didn't realize that. And for what it's worth, uh, I, I mentioned before that I presented like this like a longer version of this paper, basically, uh, in front of about, I don't know, maybe 200 or so philosophers over the past year and a half, the normal response I've gotten from left-wing professors has been, wow, you're right, I'm really surprised, but yeah, you're right, utopia will be capitalist. So this, what, I, what I'm doing here seems to work. Excellent. Um, Emily Wall asks, in a morally perf perfect capitalist society, are we still assuming unlimited wants? Uh, I didn't really take a stance on that. Uh, I'm not sure if it would make a difference. Because um, I guess the question is, would it be morally bad to have unlimited wants? Uh, I, I guess if, if it would be, then I have to assume that they don't have unlimited wants. And if it wouldn't be, then I can assume that they do. Um, I just, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it would make a difference. I think, I think Cohen uh, would say that in some sense, people have, would have unlimited wants, even in socialism. Uh, they'd always want to have more rather than less, basically for Hobbesian reasons. Uh, to be rational is to want to achieve your goals, and the best way to achieve your goals is to acquire power after power in the sense of having a greater greater means at your disposal. So uh, Jerry Cohen himself, the socialist I've been arguing with, he says that money is like a ticket. You know, the real wealth that money represents is a ticket. To have more of it means it's like having tickets to do various things and achieve your ends. So it makes sense to always want more of it rather than less. Um, I think if he's willing to say that, then I should be willing to say it too. But I don't want to. I'm not. I'm not really sure if I have to say they have li literally they have unlimited wants. I uh, wanted to point out for those who haven't seen the book covers, uh, Cohen's book uh, has just one very uh, unhealthy looking flower uh, being held out on the front, and then uh, Jason's book has just a, a bunch of very Thriving flowers. I, I think it's uh, yeah. That was, I, I got so excited when I saw the covers next to each other, and that was great. Uh, yeah, our next was, question. Go ahead. It was a yeah. It was a very deliberate choice. Uh, at one point, um, I actually had the flowers yellow, so it would be yellow and black to signify anarcho-capitalism, but it just didn't look right, so we stuck with red and black, even though those are uh, uh, socialist colors. But yeah, I wanted the argument to start on the cover, like more and better. Excellent. Uh, Jake Fuller asks, you gave a robust moral defense of markets from consequences. Do you prefer consequentialist arguments for liberty, and do you think libertarians should take argu such arguments more seriously? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which um, the kinds of arguments I've given are partly, like, the, you know, I've, I gave largely consequentialist arguments for markets, so some of them are more about autonomy and things like that. I might not have stressed that as much here. Um, and so, so I give I give in the book a mix of both deontological and consequentialist arguments. But, uh, as far as the consequentialist arguments, um, you know, I think I think it does matter. Uh, most people are most people would prefer to live in a world like suppose I, how to put this. Suppose Marxists were right about markets and the way that they work. Suppose if we had a market society, it turned out that most people would starve and only a very few very few people would flourish in that world. It, it, be kind of weird to advocate markets despite that on the grounds that like, well, we should be free. You'd say, well, freedom's kind of a curse. We don't want to be free because it's so bad for us. Uh, it, it's important, I think, to the justification of markets that they work, and they do work. 
Um, and so it's weird that libertarians, a certain subset of libertarians, will often shy away from making consequentialist arguments when the arguments are so strongly in their favor. Uh, and it's also, I think, kind of strange. Uh, I, had a, I had a blog post the other day at uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarians where I said, where are the markets suck libertarians? By which I meant there are some libertarians who, given their ideological commitments, think that it's completely irrelevant to the justification of markets that markets work out pretty well. Uh, if so, how come there aren't any libertarians that I know of that actually think markets are a complete disaster, that markets lead to the immiseration of the proletariat and to mass poverty and uh, death and starvation, but then think, yeah, but we should be capitalist anyways because of purely deontological concerns. Uh, basically, every libertarian I've ever met thinks that markets are really good, and even if there are market failures, the alternatives are worse. Um, so it seems like every libertarian is sort of already seems to think the consequentialist arguments work out in their favor, and that's kind of surprising if they think that the consequentialist arguments don't matter. Uh, so uh, even if even if you don't think consequentialist arguments matter, um, most other people do, so I think you should use them too, um, since they work. I mean, since markets do in fact work, you should, you should point that out to people. All right, uh, Daniel Duarte asks, Aren't families uh, like communes in really existing capitalism? Social, the socialist enclaves coexisting with the capitalist ethos. Yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, often when I give a uh, version of this talk, I'll say, I live in a commune. Like here, this behind me is communal. You know, like that piano is ours. That couch is ours. You know, some of those toys over there are Keaton's and some are Aiden's, but most of the stuff here is collectively owned. Like we are in a commune. Uh, and that's fine. We do have little socialist enclaves. Um, we have... We have pockets of socialism and pockets of capitalism. We're capitalists among strangers. We're socialists within families. And I think there's reason to think that even on utopian conditions, like we'll have an extension of that kind of thing. But it's worth noting that, um, you know, the way that even people in this household who I think love each other as much as, as the people in uh, Cohen's camping trip and probably more, in fact, that even then we do have some degree of capitalism. There are things that are genuinely, genuinely belong to one person and genuinely belong to others. Like, you know, there's a computer upstairs that is just my wife's. There's stuff over here that's just mine. Um, and that doesn't bring us apart. It's not because we're separate. It's because we, because we love each other and care about one another, we want people to have their own personal property, basically for the reasons that I outline in the book. Uh, so even within the socialist commune that I live in, we have private property, including private property and productive tools. Our next question is uh, from uh, Jake Fuller. He would like it if uh, I think particularly the uh, Herbert Gintis study that you mentioned, if we uh, could get the title of that so I can link it to everybody in chat. Uh, yeah, it's it's cited somewhere in the book. I'm not sure off the top of my head what, it, what it's called, but um, if you type in uh, uh, Herbert Gintis Boston Review, um, there's going to be a nice thing from him in the in the magazine Boston Review where he's summarizing his research. He's responding to Michael Sindel. And uh, um, if you kind of just Google him and look up his stuff, but if, otherwise if you have the book in front of you, somewhere in there I have like a, a link to it. And also to, I have like a citation to that and also a citation to uh, uh, Joseph Henrik and um, their stuff. But I don't, I, didn't, I don't actually have a copy of the book in front of me, so I can't find it off the top of my head. Sorry. Uh, what would you say that your... Uh, differences are in, in the way you approach philosophy from some other libertarian philosophers such as uh, Rothbard. Ray Rothbard. I think, uh, all right, well, <laughs> there's some people, I, people might know this about me. I'm not the biggest fan of Murray Rothbard uh, when it comes to his philosophical work. I don't, I don't think it's minimally good, actually. But uh, Rothbard, I think what he does is start with a very controversial moral theory that most people are inclined to reject. Um, he has a version of kind of a neo-Thomist moral theory. Very few philosophers are neo-Thomists. Uh, he very quickly generates kind of absolutist moral principles, um, and he doesn't have a particularly compelling argument for those principles. I, I don't think there's even a, even a slightly compelling argument for it, to be honest. Uh, and most people aren't going to be absolutist. So like, take like the institution of promise keeping. Uh, if I say I make a promise to meet you for dinner at six o'clock, um, but then it would turn out to be under heavy duress to meet it, or there's a disaster or something, it seems like I'm, I might be justified in breaking the promise. Um, a lot of people are going to say the same thing about property. If uh, you know, if you're walking along innocently and then a bear starts chasing you and you have to cross my property to get away from the bear, it seems like you're at least excused and possibly even justified in doing so. But 
even if I were sitting there on the sidelines, but no, you can't walk on my property. Um, if that's the case, it seems to conflict with absolutism. I don't, I don't necessarily want to get too, too deep into like whether he's right or wrong about this, but just to say that like, why base your views on a controversial moral theory that hardly anyone accepts when you don't have to? I think, I think the proper way to do philosophy is, is to avoid high level moral theories. Almost basic moral principles like don't hit people, you know, don't kick them, don't steal, etc. There's all these like mid-level moral principles that everyone agrees to and everyone kind of understands how to think about. And then the moral theories that we use to try to um, systematize these are all more controversial than the principles themselves. Now, there's a purpose in doing moral theory, but uh, it hardly ever you hardly ever going to convince somebody of something on the basis of some abstract moral theory. So I think what you should do is be like Peter Singer. Peter Singer has a crazy moral theory. Uh, you know, a certain type of preference satisfaction act utilitarianism. Hardly anyone accepts that. And aren't, you know, he has arguments for it, but most people don't find them compelling. But when Singer wants to convince you to say, give more money to charity, he doesn't do it by first arguing that his version of utilitarianism is right. And then showing that that leads to uh, his conclusions. Instead, what he does is he, he takes some thought experiments that generate intuitions that you already have and shows it leads to principles that you already accept. And then tries to show you that, according to your your pre-existing moral views, you're committed to the view that you should be giving more to charity. And he does similar things when he wants to argue that you shouldn't eat animals. Uh, it's drawing out the implications of what people already believe. Um, and I think that's just a more effective way to do political philosophy, um, in part because I'm sort of skeptical about um, the validity of most high-level moral theories. I kind of I actually wrote my dissertation in defense of moral theorizing, and then after I wrote that defense, I kind of changed my mind and think that most high-level moral theorizing is uh, is kind of bad. So would you characterize yourself as an ethical intuitionist? And uh, as a related question, what are your thoughts on the um, uh, problem of political authority, uh, Michael Humer's book? Uh, as far as, you know, meta-ethics, um, I think it gets us a little too far afield to describe exactly what my meta-ethical view is. Uh, but I think, I think what I've been saying so far is compatible with a wide range of meta-ethical views. Um, because the, the thing here is that you can have moral knowledge, to say like you have moral knowledge doesn't require that you have a high level theory that you derive things from. A good way of thinking about the relationship between moral theory and moral, like the moral judgments most of us make on the ground is kind of like thinking about what's the relationship to, you know, moral, moral theories are to moral judgments kind of what uh, uh, Einstein's field equations are to day to day physics. Uh, a person who's going to catch a ball out in the outfield isn't going to be thinking about Einstein's field equations, and he's, he, he can figure out and have genuine knowledge of where the ball is going to be, even if he's mistaken about fundamental physics. I think similar things are going to apply to morality. You can have knowledge about morality, even if you have the wrong moral theory. An example of this would be Martin Luther King Jr. He probably subscribed to divine command theory. Divine command theory is refuted 2,500 years ago. Nevertheless, he had genuine knowledge that, uh, like you know, the oppression of blacks was wrong, even though the theory that he would have used to to systematize morality was incorrect. So I don't I don't think it anything I'm saying relies upon any particular meta ethics. It just it's just incompatible with certain I think controversial meta ethical views. Um, what was the second part of the question though? I'm sorry. Uh, thoughts on uh, humor's problem oh, humor, with political. Yeah. Yeah, uh, humor humor is a great example of the kind of approach that I, that I recommend. Uh, I was actually I wrote one of the blurbs on the back of that book. I said it was a fantastic book. Uh, so humor has you know controversial conclusions. He thinks that uh, there's that we should be anarchists. Uh, he also thinks that there's no duty to obey the law, which actually is not that controversial in political philosophy. That's actually the most common view now, uh, thanks to a guy at University of Virginia named John Simmons. Uh, but when humor wants to get to these conclusions, he doesn't start by saying, here's some high level moral theory and a bunch of principles that you probably don't agree with. And I'm going to try to show you that they lead to this conclusion. Instead, what he does is he relies upon the moral knowledge that people already have. Um, he relies upon that they, they understand what's right and wrong in a bunch of basic situations. And then he's showing them that their beliefs in the authority of the state are is incompatible with other things that they already believe. And he's basically creating a tension. It's like, you either have to say a bunch of things that you're going to think are crazy about a number of other situations, or you're going to have to give up the idea that the state has authority. And when he shows that there's this tension, the only rational thing is to give up the belief in the authority of the state. Uh, and then when he wants to justify um, uh, saying the argument that anarchism would actually work, he tries to, sh to do that on the basis of empirical work and so on. So I think, I think humor is a nice example of the kind of approach I recommend, which is, 
start with what people, the basic moral knowledge that people have. Uh, pretty much everybody has inconsistent moral beliefs. And what you do in moral theorizing is show that there's an inconsistency and then kind of get to your conclusion by showing people the best way to resolve the inconsistency is to give up one thing in favor of another, something they're more confident in. Our next question is from Jake Fuller. He asks, uh, you mentioned Paul Zak. Can you tell us more about what neuroeconomics is discovering about the benevolence of humans under free? Yeah, uh, Zach has a book called Moral Markets. It's uh, an anthology, actually, of uh, all the kind of research. And uh, uh, what, what has he said about this? I mean, he, he writes a lot about oxytocin and how that creates bonding and allows us to empathize with one another. But his basic view is that uh, um, one thing that ends up happening with market society is that uh, you as an entrepreneur are constantly having to think about what other people want in order to satisfy them. And your primary motive at first is might be selfish, like you're providing something that they want, such as, you know, Anna figurines from Frozen, uh, because um, you want to make money for yourself, but then you end up empathizing with them and thinking through their needs, and that makes them more human to you. And beyond that, it's also like in a market, you interact with so many people, and the natural thing for human beings is when you interact with, you might start interacting with somebody purely out of a selfish motive, purely because you want to make, make a trade with them, but when you interact with that person over time, you come to like them more and care about them more. You don't, you become more tolerant of them and you care about them more. So there's a famous quotation by uh, Voltaire on his letters from England where he says, go to the London Stock Exchange and there you will see Muslims and Christians hanging out side by side with no degree of antipathy. and They will eat lunch together and be friends. And uh, you'll see, you know, people of all different nations interacting with one another and people who would otherwise be at war become friends. And the reason is because when you have continual interaction with others, you can tend to like them more. Uh, and it just turns out empirically this markets breed tolerance, which breeds acceptance, which breeds uh, genuine fellow feeling uh, is true. And, um, uh, in the book, actually, I cite one of the studies on that, but I can't remember off the top of my head um, who, who wrote that. But I know that there's a paper in uh, the American Political Science Review recently that was like testing that hypothesis and said that it looks like it's right. Excellent. Well, I'll put out a last call for questions now and uh, let people know about some of the stuff going on this week at Liberty Me U and next week. Uh, tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, we've got Thaddeus Russell. He's going to be talking about renegade history. Uh, Friday night, we've got uh, Jason King of Sean's Outpost. He's speaking on outcompeting the welfare state with a, a special focus on the role of cryptocurrencies. Uh, Friday, uh, Saturday night, Roger Bear, uh, also known as Bitcoin Jesus, is going to be talking about the future of Bitcoin. Sunday night, we've got Jeff Tucker. Monday night, we've got the continuation of uh, Bob Murphy's class. Tuesday night, we've got Adam Kakesh talking about his book, Freedom. And then... Uh, Wednesday night, we're starting uh, Rick Rule's course on, it's going to be really, he promises, uh, very in-depth and somewhat dry, but it's going to be an in-depth course on junior mining investment and how to do things like valuations of companies and such. So that should be really interesting stuff. Hope to see you, uh, hope to see you back this week. Um, Daniel Duarte asks, if not Cohen's, what is the strongest argument against libertarianism? And what have libertarian is, uh, libertarian philosophers done to count? Yeah, so uh, there's sort of, I, I think at this point, like there's no good argument against libertarianism under utopian conditions. Uh, if we're talking about what would a perfectly just society look like, I, I don't, I think at this point, someone has to respond to me and no one's done that yet. Um, and even when I presented this APA, no one has a good counter argument. Uh, so under utopian conditions, my view is the state of the literature is that we win, we are winning right now, and someone has to produce a response to this kind of move. But under non-utopian conditions, uh, under conditions in which people are genuinely morally flawed, uh, I think that's when you get into the questions about, like, well, what is the extent of real-life market failure versus real-life government failure? And this becomes empirical. Hardly, I, I, I'm, you know, someone who thinks utopia would be libertarian, I'm not convinced uh, that... Um, you can justify private property if it were a complete disaster and that there might be limits on private property uh, if it turns out it doesn't work out that well. So if, if it turned out that, say, uh, markets were not very good at self-regulating and governments could regulate them much better to, pre to prevent massive economic disaster, that'd be a pretty strong reason in favor of having government um, uh, intervention to the economy. If it turned out that uh, we couldn't provide anything like an adequate level of the so-called public goods under a pure market society, 
then um, I think that'd be a pretty good argument in favor of having governments provide that. If it turned out that under a market system, a large number of people, like it, with real life people, a large number of people are going to fall through the cracks through no fault in their own. Um, I think that starts to become an argument in favor of uh, redistribution. Um, and, and Rawlsians wouldn't even call it redistribution because they would deny that uh, you would have a claim to the stuff that you're being taxed to in the first place. So I think I think what libertarians need to do is take market failure arguments more seriously and really strengthen the argument that um, the alternatives are worse, that the government is not going to succeed in correcting the problems that, that people find in markets, and also that markets work better than people give them credit for. So that's where I think the kind of work that someone like Peter Leeson is doing is very important. He's saying anarchy works better than you think. We're not giving it a fair shot. Um, you know, we should experiment with anarchy and see how it could go. And uh, we should experiment with the, with markets more than we've allowed. And that a lot of the blame that uh, a lot of the blame that markets have suffered over the past couple hundred years isn't really justified. But a lot of times, what looks like a market failure is actually a government failure. So I think. Uh, I think I think honestly, like to argue for libertarianism, you have to do a lot of empirical work. It can't just be all on moral terms. Um, you know, it's most people are not socialists. Most people will say that they advocate markets. That they won't think we should fundamentally be a capitalist society, but they think government should correct some of the problems. So, if you want to ever argue for libertarianism, I think what you have to show is that government isn't going to be good at correcting those problems, and that actually the problems aren't as bad as people think that they are. And that's an empirical thing. All right, uh, last question. I promised I'd ask, ask it. A couple of weeks ago, we had a Walter Block in here, and somebody asked him if he would be interested in debating you on the non-aggression principle on Liberty Me. Uh, would you be interested? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, it's going to be – my semester is going to start pretty soon, but um, I, I suppose I could do that. I'm not, I'm not really sure what there is to debate. I, I th uh, my official view is like – yeah, I accept the non-aggression principle, and the problem is so does Marx and so does Rawls. Um, and the reason is because people don't debate the question of whether it's okay to initiate aggression against other people. What they debate is who owns what. So I think my, my view is not that the non-aggression principle is false. It's that it doesn't do the work that libertarians need it to do. That When they use it, they use it in a question-begging way. They're simply missing what the debate is. Um, I don't know if there's anything to debate about that. That just... That just seems obviously true. Uh, I think I think Block think I think what a lot of libertarians think is that I'm actually denying that the non-aggression principle is true, and I don't. That's not my view. But if 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 that's what he wants to deny, then I guess we could debate that. Yeah, I, I think uh, my my take on uh, both sides is that there's a lot of talking past each other. Um, but yeah, I thank you so much for for coming, and definitely uh, check out Jason's book. I'll link to it in chat in just a moment. And uh, we'd love to have you back sometime. Thank you everyone for coming tonight and we hope to have you back at Liberty Me U. Take care everyone. Thank you.